You're watching CES Live, powered by Ustream.tv, the most powerful way to stream live video, and by NewTek, makers of the TriCaster family of broadcast and streaming systems. And now, CES Live. Hey guys, I'm John P. Welcome back to our continuing coverage here at CES 2014. And with me, the lovely Georgia from iMore. From iMore. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, I'm glad to have you co-hosting. I'm glad to get rid of Renee because you are much, <laughs> you're smarter, you're better looking, everything. Renee's standing over there ignoring me. He's that's ah, okay. <laughs> but you guys, thanks for joining us. We also have Ben joining us from Creative Strategies. How are you, sir? I'm doing well. How are you guys? We're pretty we good. We couldn't be doing any better. Really? Well, maybe we maybe if somebody dropped like a huge bag of money on the table, I yeah. don't know. Yeah. We, we yeah. probably could be doing better, yes. but no one really. This wants is not to the that. best way to start off the year. This show, so. <laughs> <laughs> It is a lot of work. So tell us about your experience at the show. What are you What are you up to, and uh, how's it been going so far? Uh, it's It's been going pretty good. I mean, our sort of output of this show is is industry, you know, wide perspective and commentary on what we see. So I'm here looking at the trends, meeting with companies that you know don't don't exist in the Silicon Valley where I see it almost you know weekly. So meeting with a lot of Chinese companies, manufacturers from overseas, brands doing things in their markets and trying to learn more about you know what their plans are for each of these markets. So um, spending most of my time think, trying to find things that catch my eye and we think the industry needs to understand why this is important for, for the technology sector either in this year or for the years to come. So your job is like a strategist. You take all of the information you have and tell people where it's going yeah. and how to get there so you're ahead of the curve. Yeah. Yeah, we're, my firm is a typical sort of industry analyst firm, very similar to your IDCs and Gardeners, but we're much more boutique and we focus a lot more on the trends. So our goal is to say, you know, not just why tablets are selling in bulk or why PCs are not or why smartphones are doing well, but, but really why are those things happening? What are the market forces that are dictating what we see in consumer markets? Which is so important. Yeah, and it gets lost. I mean, I, I write a lot, so try to add more perspective to what gets happened in the media. But, you know, it's, it's, it is important, but often misunderstood. So, I've, I've read a lot of your writing. I love the fact, because technology can really lose people, but it's not just that you understand technology, but you understand how to put it into a form so that the layperson will understand what's happening. Yeah, and I think, you know, we, we, my background is in research. I mean, I, I started in this industry at Cypress Semiconductor, so I was in semiconductor stuff. Um, but, you know, my perspective as all of that was to get to the root, you know, of why things are doing well. So it's great that we're seeing a bunch of connected health devices and, you know, sensors and wearables and smartwatches. But is there a reason that those exist? Will people want them? Why? Um, what are the big picture applications for them? Those are all the kind of things that we do with all, this, all the different market segments that we track. So I hope to make it digestible because I just don't want technical people reading my stuff. Right. Yeah. Well, let's talk about some of these trends. I mean, we're here we are. We're at CES. It's 2014. What are like if you had to pick the big two or three that are going down right now, what are they? Well, I mean, we constantly talk about this, you know, this trend, the internet of everything. In the past few CESs, I think we've seen it come to life. What's different about this show, and, and, and one of the things that I try to encourage everybody to keep into perspective about these things is that it's not necessarily the device that really matters, it's the data. So however I get that data, is what matters to me. So it could be, you know, it could be something like a Fitbit. It could be something like, you know, a, any other number of health monitors. But what you're seeing here at the show is that sensors are now being embedded into objects that you use every day. So if you look at, um, you know, Sleep Number, they have a bed now, and they've launched Sleep IQ, which has 500 sensors in the mattress. And what it'll do is track your sleep as well as your your breathing patterns, your heart rate, restlessness, how many times you get out of bed, and your partners as well. And you'll get via their companion app all of that data. Now that to me is much better. Than wearing something yeah. right. that's trying to give me that same data. And so that's a perfect application of when sensors get embedded into things that we use. There's another company out there, uh, 9450, showing a basketball with a sensor in it. And what it'll do is it'll analyze the arc of your of your ball. Nice. It'll also analyze the spin rotation and tell you where your your shot either missed or made it on where it hit hit on the uh, on the backboard. And so that's an example of how would I have known that right with anything else. Even if I wore something, right. I wouldn't have had that data. And, and I, I'm a competitive tennis player in the Bay Area, and so Babolat actually has here a racket as well with, along the same lines where they've embedded a micro 
microchip into the handle. And what it's doing is telling you, um, it's analyzing every bit of your swing. It'll actually tell you where on the racket you hit the ball and wow. with how much power over time, as well as your spin percentage, whether it was a flat ball or a top spin. It'll analyze your first serve rotations versus your second. None of that stuff you could get with something that you wear or mount. It's only valuable, that much more valuable, because it's actually embedded into something that you care about or you use regularly. That's really what we're talking about when we talk about this internet of things. You know what's funny? Um, like a while back, uh, Callie and I were doing a presentation and we were, we were trying to explain what we kind of thought the future of this internet of things would be like. And one of, the, one of the examples I gave was along the lines of what you're talking about, you know, things you can't normally get information out of. I said, what about when you finally have a spoon that has a thermometer built into it and you can stir a pot and it tells you what the temperature, and guess what? I saw a press release <laughs> for yeah. this year. I saw a press release for yeah. a spoon with an embedded sensor. They were, they yeah. were watching. I guess they were, I yeah. don't know. I would need a spoon with a taser. <laughs> so that if I ate too much, nice. it just tased uh, me, yeah. and then I would put it down. Slow it down a little yeah. bit. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, that's one big thing, is the yeah. internet of things. Uh, you know, you mentioned also, you, you kind of alluded to like the bed and the health stuff. And I keep hearing people talking about health trends in consumer electronics. I don't really know. I don't really consider Fitbits to be health trends. I mean, yeah. is it really happening? What's going on with that? Yeah, I mean, again, there, there's there's a difference between somebody who just wants a general activity monitor. And again, this goes to my point that that's that's mildly interesting. Yeah. You know, if you're a diabetic or if you have heart disease or you know, or again, or if you're an athlete, you're you're buying very different products because the what you the reason you want that data is very different than I just need to know how many steps I've taken. And obviously, you know, with the iPhone 5s that tracks your steps, and so. It's kind of like, that's your wearable, right, for general stuff. But it starts to get really interesting, like I said, when you want deeper data, deeper context, and you're buying specialized devices that give you the output you want. And that's what we're seeing now with, with, you know, with this show, and we're seeing much more specialized devices. So you, know, you look at this from an industry-wide opportunity, it's fantastic. I mean, we're, you know, we're, we're gonna, you know, we ship hundreds upon hit hundreds of millions of, you know, of, of sensors every week into these devices. So this is a, you know, billions of plus connected. In fact, our statistics were we, we, in 2025, we'll have a trillion connected devices. Wow. And wow. so when you look at the scope and scale of that, you say, well, inevitably it does get embedded. In fact, in three years, I'd be surprised if we're even really talking about the Internet of Things. It will just be the standard norm. In Everything the same way that the Internet is, is, we don't talk about getting on the Internet anymore, everything will be connected and we will use all of these applications, you know, in conjunction with every, whatever you plug in, your coffee pot, it'll all have an, it'll all have an app. Does that scare you? There, there's something about having, you know, so much technology that has tech and everything is watching you. That's what um, uh, I think uh, Joey Tech says, too much meta. This is the same data NSA used to make predictive habits. Is that something we should be concerned about? Well, and I think the thing that is absolutely true, I mean, this is the thing that I keep you know, trying to, to, to tell you know, folks in the industry is that this is all wonderful, but what we're not talking about is security. Yeah. And while right now we're building the fundamentals of a connected ecosystem, I need to be able to manage my data, and more importantly, I need to be able to, to clarify who has access to that data and who does not. Now, if you're in Google's ecosystem, that might be a little bit more tricky. And you know, other more vertical vendors, Microsoft, Apple, and perhaps others that might create some new flavor, you know, they might be a little bit more controlling or give you the more control of that data. But the bottom line is we're not addressing security, and we have to for this to become where we want it to be. So that's one thing we talk about that's really unscathed at this point, but really needs to be addressed. And they give us a little taste, and then we get hooked, and then we can't live without yeah. it. Yeah. You know, they we become be dependent. They kind of buy your silence, don't they? They're like, what, what can we give them to make them just let us have access to everything? Exactly. And, and you love it. You love it. I, would, I don't know what I would do without my phone. It would be really difficult. Yeah, true. Interesting. Any other huge ongoing trends that we should be expecting? Uh, well, we, we're tracking for? 4K. I mean, 4K is clearly a legitimate opportunity. In fact, one of the things that's really interesting um, is if you look at the sales of TVs over the past, you know, this past holiday, 60-inch TVs and above were actually a growth sector. 
Now, you, know, you don't normally think that you know, 60 inch and above is a growth sector, but we are seeing now bigger TVs giving people a reason to upgrade. And over time, I think four, you know, 4K is going to play a big role in that. So while 4K is not going to be huge this year, I mean, we're not forecasting monster use, u, u, units for 4K in the United States. It's actually bigger in China, but we think 2015 starts to really turn that, you know, turn the page for, for, uh, for 4K. And then obviously, you know, there's other bits about that. Um, you know, curved displays are starting to get interesting. I mean, one of the things about curved displays that I think people are missed is if you're staring at a flat display and a curved display at the same time, you actually get a lot more crisp picture from all, from more viewing angles of curve than you do flat. There's also less glare. So there are some value propositions for that. Again, the technology has to mature and we're, you know, there's, the prices are too high. But those, those cost, curve, cost curves will come down dramatically. So I think over the next few years, 4K is going to be, you're going to, it's going to be a continual story that you'll hear. And it's an important one. It's a growth sector for the industry and it's one that we want as the consumer electronics industry to, to, be, to be solid. I wonder about two things when it comes to 4K. Number one is the delivery, the transmission yep. of the data, because it takes four times the bandwidth, yep. or maybe three with compression or something, but it takes a lot to deliver it. Yep. And number two, and I don't know, this may be completely off the wall, but I've already seen 8K TVs, oh, yeah. and they're amazing. Yep. And I keep thinking, well, we haven't even fully adopted 4K yet, but is there some chance we might skip it and just go right to 8K or something? Well, I think the fundamentals of, of the, the broadcast industry, again, have to evolve. And if we went from 8K, we just don't have the infrastructure to do that. So, for, so whereas HD... But we don't even have the infrastructure right now well, it's for true. 4K. So why the hell not just skip it and go to 8? The, the, the key, yeah, the key to, to the stepping stone from going from analog to digital was step one for digital broadcast, which we're in now. And some programs are 720, some are 1080. And so now we're moving toward 4K and we're getting the codec in, you know, in place now that can broadcast that broadly. So. The industry just moves in these we directions. It. Yeah, that, it that, it yeah. almost seems though that the TVs are getting so crisp that they make yeah. like real life look fake. <laughs> yeah. There's a certain yeah. point where that's good enough. Yeah, yeah. And I wonder what that'll be. I mean, again, you, you look at 4K, I think, is a, is a big step forward, right? Everybody's branding it Ultra HD. 8K, while it looks great, you know, it's. That's a pretty big, There's pretty big stream. Too much detail. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to see that <laughs> yeah. detail. Yeah. Cool. Well, speaking of detail, this is a lot of great detail. Thank you so much yeah, for coming pleasure. to join us. It's really inter interesting stuff. By the way, where can people get more? Because I mean, I know there are people who want more detail. Uh, so I'm a tech columnist for Time. So I write um, at Time. I have my own site, uh, Tech Opinions. That's more kind of industry, big picture, commentary, opinions. Um, and then you can follow me on Twitter at Ben Beharin. Nice. Wonderful. All right, thank you very yeah, much. my pleasure, thank you. You guys, thank you for sticking around for our live continuing coverage here at CES. We're gonna keep on going. We got more interviews to come, and stay tuned. Be right back.